I'm going to jump right in and get started right away. So just some uh, things to think about as you get started. Um, and some of you may want to get uh, leaving early, so I'm going to give you the secrets <laughs> right away. So if you have to leave, you'll know what the secrets are right up front. So that's certainly uh, one of the big secrets. And uh, that's also, of course, a secret that some people think is necessary. But the most useful secret is that. All right, so uh, that will help you get around. Um, before we get into the serious secrets, I just want to mention um, I do a lot of photography workshops. Uh, this year, I'm doing two photography workshops, one in Venice, uh, the second week in October. And it's for people at all levels. And we just have very, very small groups. I'll tell you a little more about it a little later on. And I also do another one the week before in Tuscany, the beautiful Tuscan landscape and the wineries in Florence and Siena and San Gimiano. And we stay at a monastery. We have lots of fun. Um, for people who are here live, you can pick up a brochure if you'd like. And also for the people here live, if you'd like to get on my mailing list, you can sign up on the clipboard. For people at home watching the live stream, you can go to my website, which is just lesterlefkowitz.com, my name. And on the home page, you're going to see a link. You just click on the links, and it will take you to the web page for the Tuscany workshop or for the Venice workshop. So if you're inclined in October, it's lots of fun. We'd love to have you. So now let's get back to the secrets of travel photography. And I've put them in a sequence, and they all begin with the word P. It stands for preparation, perseverance, and patience. Um, understand that I love to photograph, and when I'm traveling, that's basically all I want to do. I'm not interested in fancy restaurants, in sleeping on the beach, or relaxing in my hotel room. I just love to photograph and be out and explore, because for me, photography is just an excuse to see the world. And so I want to be efficient. I don't want to waste my time figuring out how to get someplace, where to go, where to eat, um, where's a camera store, because I forgot to bring spare batteries or memory cards. I want to have as much time being out in the world, unencumbered, efficient, and light, and ready to go. And so that's my philosophy of my travel photography. And I'm going to show you some suggestions, maybe, if that's appropriate for the way you like to photograph. So part of being efficient is another P, which is pre-trip planning. And this, for sure, is true. Um, the more prepared you are, I think, the more good photographs that you can get. And while I like to wander around in interesting places, I want to wander around in places that have potential photographs and not in some boring uh, desert or side street somewhere. So I believe that knowledge really is power. So along with that, I believe in these old-fashioned things some people may have heard of. They're called maps. <laughs> Anyone remember maps? They're on paper, right? Um, the trouble with using your phone, your Google map and your phone, as people say, it's like looking at the world through a straw. And you just get to see exactly where you are. And there's no sense of what's around, what's nearby, what you may be missing. And so when you have a map, you get to see not just where you are, but the surrounding areas. So for example, I was in Boston recently on business, not really there to photograph. And I picked up this free map. And it highlighted some of the great features in the Boston area. So when I had a little free time, instead of wandering around hoping to find something, I used the map, and I was able to find some really neat locations to shoot very efficiently. Let's say you want to go out to the Gateway Arch in St. Louis. Very famous place. Um, this is not my picture. I would have been embarrassed to take it. I found it online. But let's say you want to photograph the Gateway Arch and you want to make a good picture. Well, if you do your research, in this case, you could go to Google. And there's the Mississippi River. And it shows you that the Gateway Arch basically runs north-south. Not only that, it shows you that there's something called the Mississippi River Overlook. Ah, that's very important. And while you're there, there's even a geyser you might want to photograph. Now, in all places of the world, the sun comes up in the east, and it sets in the west. So if you get yourself positioned at the Mississippi River Overlook, and if you cross your fingers and hope you have a good sunset, you can get a picture like that. 
Now, that is not my photograph. I would like to tell you who took it, but there was no attribution when I found it on the internet. So it's a little bit of planning, understanding the way things are, and then you go there, and as I say, it's like shooting fish in the barrel. Anyone been to Spain? No. Right? Some people have been to Spain. And most people wind up in Barcelona, or many people do. Now, before I went to Barcelona, I went to the Barcelona Tourism website, and it told me about the very famous um, Gaudi house, the famous architect, Spanish architect, and I wanted to go to Casa Ballo. So I do my research, and it says that Casa Ballo opens every day of the week from 9 to 12, no, 9 to uh, 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock at night. But if you go at 9 o'clock, there's hundreds of people online already. So I go there at 8 o'clock. I'm one of the first people online. And as soon as I get in, I don't start on the first floor like most of the tourists. I run up to the roof. And so now I can get a picture without any tourists in the way. Because 20 minutes later, it looks like that. It's full of tourists. So I work my way down from upstairs. And again, I can get my architectural shots without any damn tourists. If you go down to the first floor where the tourists start, it's already getting full of tourists. So I try to be efficient and beat the crowds. But if you do ever get to Barcelona, definitely go and look at the Gaudi house. It is an amazing building to look at and photograph. There's more to Spain than just Barcelona. Uh, Andrea and I are big outdoorsy hikers. And again, if you look at a map, all those circles are in fact Spanish national parks. Lots of hiking, we went to these parks. There was no one there but us. All by ourselves, we found some spectacular places because the map said, hey, there are parks all over. And then based on that, we dug a little deeper and found out where they are, how to get there, where the hiking trails were. Beautiful country. Every single municipality, town, city, state, and country has tons of printed brochures as well as what they have online. Right away for them, they're free. Do it in advance, sometimes they take weeks to get to you. And inside is tons of suggestions for things you never knew existed in that particular locality. Here's a book on just Eastern Oregon, not even all of Oregon. And inside, do some work, and it says Hell's Canyon Overlook, and it says, which allows a striking view of the deepest gorge in North America. Sounds like a great place to photograph. It tells you where it is. There's even a phone number to call. Here's another book on Oregon by Brian Peterson with 150 key locations. So you start paging through the book, and maybe you want to go to the wildlife refuge or um, hang gliding, or in this case, dune buggies. I wanted to photograph the dune buggies. It told me where they were, and I was able to go there efficiently, not waste my time asking questions and where it is, and get my dune buggy pictures. The Oregon coast, for those of you who haven't been there, is spectacular. Um, the beaches, the sea stacks are just glorious. Before you die, you should drive from San Francisco up the west coast on US-1 all the way to Seattle. And it is just spectacular photographic possibilities there. And again, all by doing my research before, so I knew exactly where I wanted to go, where the beaches were, what time sunrise and sunset was, and spent time photographing, not futzing around. The border between Washington State and Oregon is the Columbia River Gorge. And it's just dotted with the most spectacular waterfalls, one after the other after the other, all about a half hour away. This is a famous Multnomah Falls. You can actually stand on that bridge. And all along the gorge, you can spend three or four days just photographing spectacular waterfalls by doing a little research before you go. National Geographic has a huge number of books and booklets and maps that I highly recommend because obviously they're very interested in photography and you'll see I think a lot of stimulating visuals with possible places to go. They have lots of maps uh, both all over the country uh, particularly but they even have many now as I'll show you for other parts of the world. There are also magazines devoted to just traveling and devoted to outdoor photography. And you might look at those. Um, there is something wrong with this particular picture. Anyone know what's wrong with this picture? Popular photography is out of business. 
No more popular photography magazine. Outdoor photographer is still good, and they have wonderful monthly places of great places you can visit, uh, I think, principally in the US. You want to go and photograph the cactus out of Arizona, you're going to go to Saguaro National Park. Before you go, get their brochure or download it. And so when you get there, you know where all the trails are and where you can photograph the cacti. If you travel overseas, I'm a very big fan of both the Rough Guides and the Lonely Planet books. In fact, I'm going to Portugal uh, this year, and I just got in the mail the other day my uh, Lonely Planet book on Portugal to get me started to figure out the kind of places I might want to go. And inside, they have tons of pictures and a lot of specific information of trails and museums and tours and ferry boats and all the things that you're going to need to be efficient. Um, in Venice, I have this little pocket guide Guide that opens up nice and big, and it has a suggestion of all the uh, hot spots and interesting places you might want to go. And now National Geographic has taken over a company, and they now put their name on these wonderful maps of major cities. These are on waterproof, tearproof paper, and I find them excellent. And so I'm a big fan of the National Geographic city guides. And in fact, on the back of this one, um, they either have the subways, and there are no subways in Venice, but they do have have the Vaporetto, which are the water buses that you can get around. So again, it's a little complicated. You might want to do your studying before you go, not when you get there. And if you study the maps well, then you can get around places very efficiently and not get lost in all the millions of little narrow alleys. So I am a big fan of maps and just getting the lay of the land before I leave, not sitting in my hotel room for two hours trying to figure out how to get where I want to be. Anyone been to England? I had a bunch of you shaking your heads, right? Well, most people start in London. London's a great place. Before you go, learn about the London Underground, their subway system. It's very efficient, much easier to navigate than New York City. But again, become familiar with it before you go. And maybe, as many people want to do, you want to go see the changing of the guard. You know, the funny guys with the big black hats. And so you do your research, and it says that it starts at 11.15. Well, here's the problem. This is what Buckingham Palace looks like. And all the tourists line up on this side of the gate, and the guys march on the other side of the gate. And there are literally hundreds, sometimes thousands of tourists. The only way to get good pictures is to be at the gate, and the gate is nice and wide, and you can put your camera lens through the gate. Everyone else is behind you, and all they see is pictures of wrought iron in front of the, the marching guys. So if it starts at 11.15, I get there at 9 o'clock or 9.30, so I'm right up front. And so then I can put my lens through the gate, and I can get all the pictures I want. And all the poor suckers behind me, they're not getting anything great. So once I decide this is what I want to do, I want to do a good job. Right? There's a secret, though. If you want to get there that early, don't drink too much coffee in the morning. <laughs> Everyone goes to Buckingham Palace, but there are lots of other places around London with the same guards where you can get up close. And there is an app, believe it or not, that shows you where all the guards are around London. And you can get up close, and you can get pictures like this. Whereas Buckingham Palace, where everyone goes, you've got a big fence in front of you. So research before I went, I knew just where to go, and I didn't have to hassle with anybody else. London is a nice city, but we're big outdoorsy people. So we went up to the Lake District and the Yorkshire Dales. Beautiful country up there. I have no idea what's there and where to go. Before I went, we got a book called Short Walks in the Lake District. And so knowing where to go, where to park, what to do, we were able to get some great pictures. Again, preparation, preparation. You want to stay back in the US? Maybe you want to go down to Austin, Texas in the San Antonio area. There's a whole book on just photographing Austin and the environs. It tells you about the state capitol in Austin, and so you can go and get set up. And beautiful, you can photograph the dome inside. You're allowed to use a tripod there, no problem, no questions asked. And I got this picture of this young woman uh, celebrating her quinceanera. Um, and with a tripod. I was able to do it because I knew beforehand that would be allowed. 
other places in the world. Some people use these eyewitness guides. So here's one for Turkey in Istanbul, um, Seattle. Where's the Space Needle? How do I get there? It's a great place to photograph. The book tells you, and you just show up, and you can go right there without wasting any time. I don't know if you know, Seattle is also known for its art glass, and I wanted to photograph that. Again, doing research before I went, I was able to get this close to the guys making glass. And I, was able, I spent almost an hour there. It was really fascinating to be able to get that close to them. I bet many of you have been to Washington, D.C., but I bet nobody here has been to this building. This is the United States Botanic Garden. It's just a few blocks from the Capitol. Well, it's a garden. I want to take pictures, and I probably need a tripod. I'm a big flower photographer. So you go online, and you check, and it says photography and sketching. Wow. And it says permission to use tripods. Just what I need. But you have to apply a few days before, fill out a form online. When you show up, they give you a permit, and you can photograph all day with your tripod. Now, you don't need a tripod inside to photograph this, but if you want to photograph their wonderful collection of bromeliads close up, you have to have a tripod. So if you didn't know about it, you couldn't get these pictures. So research, research, research. Here's another important little map. These are all the public restrooms in Venice. <laughs> Very helpful to have. Right? And speaking of Venice, um, you can go online anywhere in the world and find out what time sunrise and sunset is. Best light is sometimes early in the morning and late in the afternoon. So if sunrise is around, say, 7.15 or so, that's when the sun comes up, but the prettiest light is before then, usually. So I get to the Academia Bridge about uh, 6 o'clock in the morning. I know it faces east. That's a hint, all right? Faces east, that's where the sun comes up. And I get there long before the sun comes up and gets set up, and I can make 30-second exposures. So you can see there's just a little light in the sky. And maybe 15, 20 minutes later, there's even a little more light in the sky. So I'm hanging out there the whole time just waiting for things to happen in front of me. And then eventually, well, we're not going to get a good sunrise that day. Too bad. But on other days, you get a spectacular sunrise because I knew where to stand and I knew what time to get there. All from the Academia Bridge early in the morning. There is a bit of software called Photo Ephemeris, which I highly recommend. It is free for your desktop, and it's just a few bucks for your mobile device. And in any place in the world, it says if you stand here any day of the year, it tells you sunrise, sunset, moonrise, moon face, dawn, and dusk, elevation of the sun at any time of the day, and where on the horizon it will come up. And if you're serious about wanting to know all that information, this is a fantastic app, and I've used this a lot. Very, very helpful, very easy to use. All right, so you've done your research, good boys and girls, and now you're getting ready to pack and you want to know what to take. Well, if you're going to do a good job, folks, you need all of this and all of that. That's kind of a joke. <laughs> Although I have brought all of this at times. But it turns out that this is true. If you bring too much stuff, you don't use it. Then you wind up using your cell phone for the rest of the trip. right? And everything else is in your hotel room. <laughs> And so you got to be careful. And you're fortunate because the technology in small, light, high-quality cameras has improved tremendously in the last few years. This is a collection of some of my cameras. My big professional Nikon weighs five and a half pounds. The medium Nikon weighs three and a half pounds. And the Fuji, which I'm using now, only weighs little more than two pounds, and I started with my first mirrorless camera, which is only one and a half pounds. And every year, they're getting better and better and better. I started just to try it, someone recommended, and I wasn't thinking this is really a serious camera. This was Fuji's first mirrorless camera. And I said, well, what the heck, I'll treat myself. I took it on a hike, I took it to Italy, and I said, gee, man, this is pretty darn good. This is not Italy, by the way, this is Texas, right? and this is Boston. 
And so I then got their next one, that was the E2, and then they came out with the X-T1, and now I'm using the X-T2, and I'm not here to push Fuji or anything else. The point is now the smaller mirrorless cameras are excellent. As a professional, I cannot compromise on image quality, and if it was second rate, I'd still be using my big Nikon gear. But the fact is, it's wonderful, I can make big prints, high ISO, dynamic range is just fantastic, and much better for traveling than my big stuff. So all I need is the camera and a few memory cards. All mirrorless cameras eat batteries. Make sure you have spare batteries with you. So it comes with the basic zoom lens, but I like to carry a telephoto zoom and a wide angle zoom. And with those things, a little pouch on my waist, polarizing filter, some memory cards, batteries, and a remote release. On my waist, I'm good to go. And that's what I look like when I'm photographing. I'm fast, I'm loose, I'm unencumbered, and unobtrusive. And that's really changed my ability to make good travel pictures in the last few years. And again, that's what it looks like. You can see I just have the hip pack, and I don't look like a you know obnoxious tourist with a giant camera and a giant lens. And of course, don't forget when you travel overseas, the charger and the appropriate plug adapters. That's all you need. For those people who do not want to use interchangeable lenses, there are now these new cameras called super zooms or bridge cameras. They have a fixed lens, but the lens is quite versatile. It goes from moderately wide angle, not super wide, but moderately wide, to super telephoto. So if you're going to Africa, <laughs> you might want to take something like this because it's very, very telephoto, only moderately wide. And then all you need is the camera, battery or two, some memory cards, charger, and you're good to go. If you do want to bring interchangeable lenses, people always ask me, what's the appropriate lens to bring? So my standard answer is just to bring all of these, and then you don't have a problem. Right? Now, actually, I do own all of those lenses, but of course I do not bring them with me. Um, just to show you the versatility of what lenses can do, if I stand in one place in Mojaca in Spain, this is with a very wide-angle lens, depending on what uh, format you use, you, uh, the focal length changes, but the apparent field of view is the same, so with an APS-C camera, you'd get the same as with a 17 millimeter on a full frame camera, and if you had an eight millimeter lens on a micro four thirds, it would all look the same. So that's very wide, and then this is maybe a little moderately wide, and this is now we're starting to get more normal focal length, and now we're slightly telephoto, and even more telephoto, and more telephoto, and a lot of telephoto, and that's all standing in the same spot. So just by changing lenses or zooming, it's amazing the difference in the scene that you can get. Same thing here, this is with quite a wide angle lens, if you were shooting with an APS-C camera, um, you'd need about 11 millimeters. And if you were shooting with a micro four thirds, you'd get the same view with maybe eight millimeters. But they would all look the same. The focal length doesn't matter, what matters is the field of view that you're getting. Standing in the same place, there's your moderate wide angle, and there's your telephoto. All from standing in the same place. Oops, wrong way, let me back up here. Can I go backwards? Yes, backwards is this way. Sorry. Most of the time when you buy a camera, it comes with a so-called kit lens. Very often it's something like this, moderately wide to moderately telephoto. And for many people, that's enough. You don't have to carry another lens. And it lets you do lots of photography in most of the places that you visit. You don't need necessarily very wide or very telephoto. If you're light and loose, you can get lots of pictures. If you want to treat yourself and get a little more sophisticated kit lens, so to speak, your zoom lens, these have a little more in the telephoto end, but nothing more in the wide angle lens. And so it's a good choice when you want to be a little further away from people or see something a little further in the distance to bring it close. And a lot of people don't think of a telephoto lens for landscape, but I use it all the time, and it's also good for people shots so you don't have to be on top of them, or the McDonald Observatory in Texas. And again, I do use telephoto lenses for scenery a lot. A lot of people don't, but it lets me see things and capture things I couldn't normally get. 
there are some kind of general purpose telephoto lenses that cover a huge range from, again, moderately wide to quite telephoto. And it's a very good choice, you know, if you're doing animals or sports or things that are far away and you can't get close. And so I used them, of course, when I was in Antarctica. And I also, again, use them for landscape photography, if appropriate, including in London. That's very telephoto. And they do, as you probably know, compress the space. They make background and foreground look much closer together. And sometimes it can be very effective. But I'm a big fan of wide-angle lenses. I really use wide-angle lenses a lot. And so these are the quite wide-angle that are Wonderful. People think of wide-angle lenses as if I'm indoors or if it's crowded, I need a lens to get the whole world in. And that's certainly one of the main reasons that you'd use wide-angle lenses. But I also like them for landscape because here's a lens that's just moderately wide, but if you have a really wide lens, you get that. And it has a much nicer sense of space and expanse than you'd get um, with this one. Um, same thing here, but it also uses to exaggerate the foreground and yet still see the context way far away. And so again, this is a very wide angle lens. I'm laying on the ground. This is in the Sequoia Grove in uh, Yosemite National Park. And very dramatic picture because the wide angle gets in all the trees in the foreground as well as the top of the trees way, way high up in the air. It's also good for the very narrow little streets and little villages you might go find around the world. Um, here I'm down on my knee and it makes the flowers very large and yet again the very narrow street appears in the background. Makes for very interesting perspective. Or if you want to get in the whole world, that is Las Vegas. So I use it sometimes close and sometimes far. Um, these people with their cell phones are not getting in nearly as much as I got with my very wide angle lens. And here in Florence, again, very wide lens gives me a wonderful perspective on the Duomo and on the whole city. Um, if you go and photograph the Colosseum, which is really big, <laughs> again, this is an extreme wide angle and it lets me get in a good chunk of that wonderful old, I don't know, uh, stadium. I was going to say building. I wouldn't call it a building. Um, and again, I use it in the narrow streets. And wide angle lenses are my friend. Um, here's an example. This is what you'd get on this small graveyard. Um, this was in uh, Bavaria. And this is with a moderate, slightly telephoto. And here's the same thing with a wide angle. And you can see how you get this very dramatic perspective. I'm only like a foot away from the crucifix there. Whereas here, I'm many feet away. And so this compresses the space, brings things closer together, and this exaggerates the difference between the foreground and the background. And so I'm a big fan of wide angle. Here's another one, same thing. I'm down on the ground, and the pine cones get relatively very large, and yet because it's super wide angle, I can also see almost the top of the tree. And they can also be a lot of fun if you get very close to animals. If you want to do a hatchet job on your friends, do a portrait with a wide angle lens, right? They will not like you. Other things that you might want to bring. Don't forget lots of memory cards. Memory cards are cheap. You're going to take more pictures than you thought you would anyway. So let's say um, you've got a 24 megapixel camera. Maybe you only have 16, but this is just a rough idea. And let's say you have a 32 gigabyte card. You can get 2,000 JPEGs typically on a 32 gigabyte card, but if you're shooting raw, you only get 700. So you'll probably need a few more cards. The difference in price has to do with the so-called speed of the card. If you're shooting video that generates a lot of data quickly, then you'll want a fast card. Otherwise, it doesn't matter. Don't waste your money. If you're shooting stills, get the least expensive name brand card because it has no effect on image quality. You'll only need it if you're shooting video. It does also improve the downloading speed most of the time. That's not an issue for most people. So don't waste a lot of money on an expensive fast card if you're only shooting stills. And then a few other things I carry, not with me, but back in the hotel room, a little blower if I get dust in the sensor, lens caps because I'm always losing them, uh, lens tissue, a polarizing filter, which we'll talk about in a moment, some spare batteries, the charger, and that's all I need. 
I am a fan of putting clear filters to protect all my lenses. I'm at where it's dirty and dusty and rainy, so you can buy either the so-called uh, lens protect or UV filters. The UV was necessary with film. It's not necessary with digital, but people still buy them anyway. They're both clear filters. A few years ago in Greece, a bellhop dropped my camera bag, which I didn't know, and when I took the lens out of the bag, the lens filter looked like that. If the filter hadn't been there, the $2,700 lens would have looked like this. So I'm a believer in protective filters on all my lenses. The only other filter I carry is a polarizing filter. Polarizing filter screws on the lens, and it has a rotating collar. So you look through the camera and you rotate it. If you have a blue sky, it will make the blue sky darker. It will not make a cloudy sky blue. You put it on and you rotate it. If nothing happens, take it off because it eats two stops worth of light. I see people going around with it on all the time, not smart. It's wonderful, I do a lot of landscape work. Look at this, it just cuts right through the haze. And if you're in the right angle to the sun, um, it's amazing how much better. If you're at a good angle to the water, look at this. This is without the filter, this is with. It goes right through the water. Now, if you're perpendicular to the water, it won't work. You have to be at about a 35, 45 degree angle. Same thing here, you can see with the shadows, I'm exactly perpendicular to the direction of the sun. And look at how dramatic that is. As I said, it will not help a cloudy day, and you don't need it in towns and villages usually, but boy, it, in some situations like landscape like this, look at the difference. This was early in the morning in Spain, and you can see the sun is on the right, very hazy, dust in the air, and believe it or not, unretouched, this is exactly the same picture with and without the polarizing filter. So I always carry it, it's very small, it's in my camera bag when I'm doing landscape particularly, um, I use it. If you like to do small details in buildings or flowers, some very uh, small, inexpensive little thing to throw in your camera bag are these so-called close-up filters or close-up lenses. They come in a little kit. It's really like a magnifying glass that goes in front of your lens. You can put it on any lens and it lets you get closer than you normally could. They come in usually a set of three strengths. You just get the diameter that fits your particular lens. You can use it with a zoom lens. And so if you're out on a hike and you find a bunch of mushrooms, you screw it on your lens and you can get some really nifty close-up pictures. And it weighs very little, takes up very little room. So it's just another little accessory that some people like to carry with them. When I take students on these trips, they always ask, do I need a tripod, Lester? All right. Does this sound familiar? Right. I don't want to carry it, it's too much trouble. Right. These are just some of my tripods and I have even more. I do not carry a tripod with me all the time. Modern cameras, high ISO, during the day I usually don't need a tripod. But if I'm going to be up early in the morning or late in the afternoon or in the evening, I love to photograph at night, then I'm going to have to have a tripod if you're going to get decent photography. So here's the Academia Bridge early in the morning. It's a one second exposure. Now, you could use high ISO and take this at a higher shutter speed. But then you'd lose the sense of motion of the boat, and you'd have more noise and less dynamic range in your picture. Here's another one, one and a half seconds. You probably couldn't do this no matter how high you cranked up the ISO. In Tuscany, there's a half a second. Now again, crank up your ISO to 3200, you probably could take this handheld. But it wouldn't have the dynamic range, you wouldn't have good shadow detail, and it would be much noisier in the shadows. Same here, this, this picture, if I remember, was about um, 20 seconds long. You can't do this without a tripod. What's, what's interesting is how your mind works. I took this picture years ago, but I remember I took it at exactly 10 after six in the evening. That's a joke. <laughs> you can't take a picture like this if you want motion blur. You have to be on the tripod and the cars have to move. This is maybe a one second exposure in Toronto. This is very late in the day from Brooklyn, looking at lower Manhattan. 
10 second exposure. You can, no way you can do this uh, handheld no matter how high you crank up the ISO. Or down uh, in the district near Miami, the Art Deco region, right? You want to get that sense of activity in the car street. Six second exposure, have to have a tripod. Or in Greece, in the evening. You can photograph in gardens without a tripod, but not if you want to do close up pictures like this and get good results. So I'm a believer in bringing the tools that I need. And so if I know I'm going to a garden, if I'm going to be out in the morning or at night, that's when I bring my tripod. And I can make pictures that I could never make without it. So you've got this stuff. It's not a lot, but you still have to carry it. And you want to make sure that you're unobtrusive and not burdened, right? So this is probably not the way to go around, right? <laughs> So here's some tips, right? I never buy shirts with one pocket. Right? If you look at me now, I have two pockets. All my shirts have two pockets, and in fact, I try to buy shirts that have balloon pockets, because that's where all the lens caps go most of the time, or spare batteries. And then I have my little pouch on my belt that I mentioned, where I have my two other lenses in there. And there's no end of pouches you can get in the store at B&H. Dozens and dozens of pouches of all sizes and all flavors, whatever your needs are. It goes on and on. You can even get a fanny pack and then swing it around the front to get out your cameras and your lunch. This is the big pack I used to take when I carried my big professional Nikon gear. And you can see it's enormously big. The nice thing is it had a waistband, but it was still big and heavy. I bring backup hard drives, I bring a small laptop. So I do have a photo backpack, which I use to bring my gear on the plane. I don't carry this when I'm photographing, but it's all my extra spare bodies, things like that. And again, backpacks come in dozens and dozens of different styles and size. Speaking of airline travel, some things you may know, right? Never put this in your checked baggage, right? Always have it with you in the plane. All my hard drives with my pictures, and the most important thing is don't put your kids in the luggage. Some airlines are getting very fussy about how much carry-on you can take, right? Here's a photographer's trick. Don't tell anyone, all right? You get yourself what's called a nylon shell. It's a lightweight jacket. It has big pockets. Right? And you stuff the pockets with all your big stuff, your big lenses and your backup hard drives, and you can get a pouch like that, and you put the camera around your neck and you get on the plane and nobody annoys you. Right? It has to go through x-ray, but so what? But at least you can still have more room in your other carry-on and you can carry all this stuff with you. So all photographers know this trick. Another thing to worry about is, God forbid you leave things in your hotel room, right? No, that's not the most common thing left there. Nor is that. Nor is that. What is the most common thing left in hotel rooms? Charger. Chargers, right. And guess what, folks? No charger, no pictures, right? And it's very easy to do, and all I can do is warn you, right? People say, well, <laughs> I'll, I'll buy a charger in Istanbul, right? Well, here's a list of Nikon chargers, depending on what camera you have. There is only one store in the whole world where you can walk in and buy any one of these chargers. And do you know what that store is? Yeah. Here, it's B&H Photo. Nowhere else in the world will you be able to find a charger for your camera. So I am just warning you, be doubly, triply careful. When I'm photographing early in the morning or in cool parts of the year, standing around as a photographer, it, you get cold. You're standing around waiting for things to happen. You're not walking and you're not moving. So um, here's one thing that some photographers use. These are um, silk glove liners that skiers use. They're very thin and will give you a little bit of warmth. If it's getting colder and you're photographing in the winter, you can buy these so-called convertible gloves. So it keeps you warm, and then the fingertips pop off when you have to operate your camera. When I was in Antarctica, I used convertible mittens like this. These are really good. They're really toasty warm, and you can flip them up if you have to get to some of the camera controls. So that's really, really neat. If you're photographing where it's hot and buggy, it's hard to stand around a lot while you're being eaten up. The best insect repellent in the world contains something called DEET, 
right? Not the thing in the background, but DEET. And everyone swears by DEET. DEET is wonderful, but it has one downside. <laughs> it eats plastic. So when you put it on, make sure you get it off your hands so that when you touch your camera, you don't melt part of your cameras, right? So B41, great stuff, but not so good for plastic. Okay, so you're there, you've done your research, you got your camera gear, you got on the plane, everything's hunky-dory, and some of you like to do people photography. So let's photograph, start with people you know. And I bet you all have pictures that look like that. Right? Your loved one or your relative standing there with their head in the middle of the picture. But you say, go over there and smile, right? That's what you say. And all your pictures look like this, right? <laughs> Everybody here is chuckling. How come you're chuckling? Right? These are terrible. That's Andrea. I love Andrea, but I don't photograph her this way. She poses for me for these pictures. Don't photograph your loved ones like this. It is so boring and so awful. <laughs> photograph what you're doing, what they're doing. Have some fun. What's going on? Don't have people pose. You're on a hike. You're doing shopping. You're in the restaurant. Those are human pictures. It shows the fun you're having, what's going on. Not standing there posing in front of some church or some statue. Right? Then people could, don't take a picture of your food, take a picture of somebody enjoying the food, right? What are you doing? That's what's important, not standing there. By the way, that little white line on the bottom, anyone know what that white line is, that white wire? That's called an electric fence. Okay, if you're out in the rural areas, you'll see those all over the world. If you touch that wire, that is the part of the trip you will remember for the rest of your life. So be careful, it's very thin and easy to touch. You don't want to touch that. I know. Um, so what's going on? You know, you can show where you are and you can show your loved one, but do it in a way that's interesting to look at. Make photographs, not just snapshots, right? This is after a big hike up in Bavaria. Having a good time, what'd you eat? Show people enjoying themselves, right? Don't photograph your kids this way, it's terrible, right? Kids are full of energy. Right? They, they pose and they fool around. Those are interesting pictures, not standing there, right? Wow, you made it to the top of the mountain. Show the mountain. Don't just show a close-up of someone standing there. Same thing here, right? If I do travel with people, I tell them the only reason I bring them is for scale. <laughs> Put them in context. That's what you should do with people. Now, some people like to photograph strangers, people they don't know. And a lot of people are kind of uncomfortable with that. They're out of their comfort zone and they try to do what I call sneaky candid pictures. And it's pretty hard to get good candid pictures of people, sneaky. Some people are okay, but it's not very easy. Once in a while I look out and I get something good or you find a couple who are so in love, a bomb could go off and they wouldn't notice you. And then sometimes you can photograph from the back or you can get people who are so engaged, again, they don't notice you. But in general, it's not the best way to do it. Here's a series I did, in fact, in Venice. It's crowded with tourists. So hundreds of tourists are walking toward me and I just place myself in one spot. I use a telephoto lens and I just let the people walk toward me. And over a period of an hour, I get some really cool photographs. And sometimes they're only a few feet away from me. But there's so many people and they're so engrossed in what they're doing, they don't even notice me. And this was at a fair in northern Italy, and it took me about 20 minutes to get to the front of the group of people so I could get this close-up of this guy showing how bread is made. There are buskers all over the place, musicians, magicians, and you put a few euros, a few coins in their hat, and now you can get up close and get some wonderful pictures. This is what you might get the ordinary tourist, you give the guy a few euros and now you can get really close and get some nice pictures. If they're cooperating with me, I have no um, worry to give them a few euros. They're out on the street trying to earn a living. I'm trying to get some good pictures. I saw this lady. Um, she didn't speak a word of English. I didn't speak a word of Italian. I approached her. The trick to taking pictures of strangers is smile. You go up and you smile, you point to your camera, say photo, 
smile and they usually say, okay. Now, sometimes they'll turn you down and you have to accept that. But if you don't push the camera in front of your face and be aggressive and smile, watch what they're doing, maybe point to the, maybe they have a nice hat on or something interesting about them. Most people approached in a nice way would usually cooperate and that's when you get your good pictures. So this is what I saw and she said, sure, take my pitch. This was a fisherman. Again, didn't speak a word of English. He's repairing his nets. I approached him with my camera. He shrugged his shoulders and said, sure, you want to take my picture? And so I got these wonderful candid pictures of this guy. He was a real character. But I never would have gotten this by sneaking photos with a telephoto lens. And what I always do is when I'm done, I show them the pictures and they get a kick out of it. And some people give me their email address and I always send them pictures. If you're gonna photograph kids, who aren't yours, always ask the parents. Always ask the parents. Here's a guy I saw, I think in Siena. I walked past him and I said, I got, I'm sorry, I gotta get his picture. <laughs> I turned around and came back and he let me photograph him. That is a gorgeous face, right? But I asked, you couldn't get this photograph if you tried to sneak it, it wouldn't work. And this guy too, I pointed to his sunglasses and basically said, wow, those are so cool. And when you flatter people, they all love to have their pictures taken. Another thing you might do is include people in the scenery, if again, for a sense of scale. Um, this is a cypress tree, but when you put your loved one in it now, you get a much better sense of how big it is. Volcano in New Zealand. How big is it? I don't know. Put somebody there. Don't have them pose in the middle of the picture, please. <laughs> Same thing here. Uh, southern Spain, I believe. And it's a seacoast picture. It's kind of blot, needs something. But I noticed something. If you watch in the upper left, watch. See the difference? As <coughs> soon as you put those people in, it gives a sense of scale. Thank you very much for wearing a red jacket. <laughs> Now, I noticed the people up there, but they weren't on the edge, and I just waited and waited, and some people never came to the, but these, this one couple, they came to the edge, and they helped make my picture. In Greece, I saw this evocative alleyway with stairs, but it needs something, and I literally waited 20 minutes. There was nobody around for 20 minutes, and then this lady came running in, and there's my picture. Without her, there's no picture as far as I'm concerned. But patience, once I see something, you don't want to be with me because I'll stay there <laughs> until something happens. And sometimes nothing happens, but very often it does. If you leave right away, certainly nothing will happen. Same thing here, interesting little alleyway, waited and waited and waited, and this guy zoomed up on his motor scooter, made the picture. Without it, it's just nothing special. If you go out to Yellowstone, you want to see Old Faithful? Everybody stands around on the walkway and everybody gets this picture. It's just a lot of steam. So before it let loose, I walked a few hundred yards over some rubble and I got this picture. And that gives it a sense of scale and much more drama than this, which is just a bunch of steam. Believe it or not, that's in Texas. And it looks really cool, but a better sense of scale with somebody in it, or a selfie. Mm -hmm. If you hand your camera to someone else, try to explain to them they shouldn't put you in the middle of the picture. This was a nice tourist who took our picture in New Zealand, and I explained exactly how I wanted it framed, and he did a really good job. So you see the waterfall, you see us, but it's a much more interesting picture than just a snapshot of the two of us standing in the middle of the picture. And by the way, if you look in the background over our heads, look what's there. I bet you didn't notice that. I'm always looking around. Tree. I'm sorry. This one, right? You see the tree right in the back? Yeah. So standing on that platform, we got, we got this picture and we got that. Another very important issue is the time of day. When are the best times to photograph? Well, certainly for many photographers, you'll hear that they tell you, very early in the morning. And what are you doing? 
You're probably sleeping. Right? Well, okay, early in the morning is still good, right? What are you doing? Having, probably having breakfast, right? Uh, in the middle of the day, light is kind of blah, but let's go late in the afternoon when the sun is starting to get low, right? What are you doing late in the afternoon? Uh, you're looking for a restaurant. <laughs> it's not going to work. Well, what about at sunset? I'll get some pictures at sunset. What are you doing at sunset? You're in a restaurant and you're having dinner. What about at dusk? It's a beautiful time to photograph, right? Dusk. What are you doing? You have a dessert now. <laughs> okay, okay. Let's go out and do some pictures at night and evening, right? What are you doing? You're in your hotel room. So all the best times of the day, you're not available. Sorry. So middle of the day, Greece, this is what it looks like. It's okay, but nothing special. If you go out at dinner time at dusk, see all those lights along the shore? Those are all restaurants. Everybody's there except me. And that's a lot more interesting than this. During the day, in the evening. Middle of the day, right before sunset. Yeah, this is okay. That's more okay. Middle of the day, blah. Right before the sun goes behind the mountain, more interesting. Middle of the day, ugly. Come back in the evening, much more evocative. Venice is pretty any time of the day, but it's more mysterious in the evening. This is a 30 second exposure on a tripod. Crawled out of my tent in New Zealand, the sun had just come up, you can see the very long shadow. You sleep in for 30 minutes, it looks like that. Huge difference, a nice golden light in the morning. 15 minutes before the sun set behind the mountain, you get that beautiful golden puddle of light. 15 minutes later, it's gone. If you want to do sand dunes, you need very low sun angle. You got to get up early in the morning before all the damn tourists walk all over the sand and mess it up. So in the summer, you got to get up at five o'clock if you want to get pictures like this. Anyone been to Monument Valley out west? All right, in the middle of the day, it's blah, looks like that. I shot it right before the sunset. And then the next day I got up at five in the morning and got the sunrise. But in the middle of the day, there's nothing worth photographing. Marfa uh, in Texas. What's my source of illumination here? Car headlights. <laughs> I'm always at, I'm photographing all the time, I'm crazy. People like to photograph sunsets. I like to photograph sunsets too. Some people, as soon as the sun sets, they pack up and go away. But the best color is after the sun sets. Stick around. So here's the same spot, and it just kept getting better and better and better and better. All right. Don't run away. See what's going to happen. Late afternoon too, the low sun angle makes some really dramatic light. First of all, it's warm, and you get nice long shadows and nice contrast. That's a good time of the day, much more interesting than in the middle of the day. I usually reserve the middle of the day for either traveling or photographing indoors or doing people in the shade, things like that. But landscape in the middle of the day usually looks pretty blah. Florence in the middle of the day, nice day, not bad. But if you, get, if you look out with a good sunset, look how lovely that works. And then a few minutes later, they turn the lights on. And you catch that at the right time on a tripod. But if you wait too long, it looks like this. And now it's too dark. On the other hand, if you're willing to lay in the street and get almost run over, you can still photograph at night. The nice thing now is you have high ISO. Um, if you kneel down, you can take a picture like this at about an eighth of a second or a quarter of a second and still get a sharp picture. So even when it's dark out, if you can find a bunch of street lights, you can still photograph at night. So besides time of day, since you'll be outdoors a lot, weather is certainly a very important consideration. So I'm constantly checking online, I'm constantly checking forecasts. So here's one that says in Moscow, um, it's gonna be snow showers, and you go to another site, and it says it's just gonna be cloudy. 
So what I usually do is I check with two or three sites and I pick the one I like the most. <laughs> I do keep an eye on the weather, obviously, it's important. So I'm in one town, this is again Florence, I believe, and it was just a cloudy blah day, but I can't stop myself, and so while I'm there, I photograph. And I leave this venue, and three hours later, the sun comes out. And I ran back and photographed the same spot, because that's me. Same thing here, this is the Duomo in Florence on a cloudy day, and then a few hours later, the sun comes out. It makes a huge difference. You have no control over the weather. And so sometimes I have to come back if possible. I love fog. Huh. Fog is gorgeous. You know what, folks? You know when you get fog? Early in the morning when you're sleeping. <laughs> but if you get up early, you can get some pretty amazing pictures. I love fog. It those changes and changes and changes. It's all in the fog. So we were in uh, Bavaria a few years ago. We're big hikers, and there's a lot of great hiking in Bavaria. And so for a whole week, it drizzled every single day. We were really, really unhappy. And it, you couldn't really photograph much. So what do you do? Well, you don't stay indoors. So you go out at night, and even though it's miserable, you can get some great pictures. And near there is Salzburg in Austria. So we drove to Salzburg, and it was drizzly and terrible there too. But again, come back at dusk, and now that drizzly, miserable day doesn't look so bad. I always carry a baggie and some tape, and if it's not pouring, you can still go out and make pictures and just bring a towel or something to take the drops off your lens or find places to stand under, and you can still get some pictures even if it's drizzly. Somebody once said, there's no such thing as bad weather, only different weather. So as much as I hate day after day after day of rain, it doesn't stop me. I go outside and I see if there's something that I can capture even in the rain. Snow is also great because it reflects lots of light. Sometimes strong light is good, sometimes strong light is bad. So here's a scene in um, Ushuaia, tip of South America. And for this scene, the strong sunlight I find is too harsh. But if you hang around and you're observant, the sun goes behind the clouds for a moment, and now you get this. These, both these pictures were taken within 15 minutes of each other. So this is bad light for this scene, this is appropriate light. On the other hand, that same soft light for this picture, I find kind of blah. Sun comes out from behind the clouds, and now you get that. So there's no right or wrong. There's no rules, you will never hear me expound on a rule. It's what's appropriate for the scene, and you've got to be aware and pay attention to what's happening. I can sense the sun going in and out of the clouds just by the temperature on the back of my neck sometimes without even looking. Sometimes it's about the weather. That's what your picture is about. Sometimes it's just the spectacular skies. This, is in, uh, this one is in Oklahoma. It poured like hell. Five minutes after I took the picture, I've never seen so much rain in my life. But right before it poured, a really interesting picture. So I'm always ready to photograph because sometimes the weather, the sky, is what's spectacular about a picture. How do you find the good spots to photograph? Well, we talked earlier about preparing, doing research, and things like that. Uh, another possibility is when you get to a city or a town or a country, is check out the postcards, because they have all the, you know, the hot tourist spots there. And sometimes they have little brochures. So here's a personal story. A few years ago, I was in San Francisco. I wanted to photograph these famous um, gingerbread houses, but I didn't know where they were. So I bought a postcard and I stopped someone on the street and I said, where is this? And the person said, oh, that's in Alamo Square. You get out your map, you find out where Alamo Square is, and you go there, bring your tripod, and I got my picture. But I had no idea where those houses were. Arizona Highways is a spectacular map of wonderful, wonderful photography for the state of Arizona. And so I got an issue that talked about the famous slot canyons outside of Page, Arizona. I knew all about it. I went there and I got my pictures. If you ever go out west, go to the slot canyons. It's a religious experience. 
is an amazing place to photograph. Tripods, strongly recommended. There's something called Photograph America Newsletter. A photographer goes around the country, and every few weeks, he issues a newsletter with very detailed information about particular locations. You might check into that. If I'm traveling to a city, I always like to get up high. No matter where I am, I want to climb a mountain, get on top of a stool, something to get me higher for a more interesting perspective. So I go online, I Google each city, and see if each city has a tower. So when I was up in Toronto, there is the CN Tower. Went up there, took some pictures, came back at night, and I don't know if you can see, but there's a bad reflection in the window, which I wasn't able to get rid of. But I have my maps of Toronto, and it says that there's the CN Tower, right? But there's a little island across the little bay there. And if you take the three-minute ferry ride and then walk for about 20 minutes, now you're facing the city. And with my tripod, I was able to get that picture. And that picture made me a lot of money as a stock picture for just having a map and a 20-cent ferry ride and a little bit of walking. If you come with me this year to Tuscany and we go to San Gimiano, you can go up in the tower, one of the many towers there. If you want to climb the steps, you don't have to. But the view from the top is spectacular. It's much better than being on the ground with all the tourists. And you get a point of view that I think is much more spectacular than just standing on the ground like everybody else. If there's a place where I can go up, I'm there. This is in India last year. And, and, oops. and this is on the ground, a lot of bananas, and it's okay, but I found a staircase to go up, and I think this is a much more interesting picture. This is kind of expected, ordinary, it's okay, but I think as a photograph, it's more interesting to look at. You may get tourist maps that look like that, and they have these symbols over here, and these are the photo spots that the local tourist bureau thinks you might want to visit. And what the heck, right? Go and see if it's appropriate for what you want. So these are some spots uh, in Siena that were recommended. Yeah, pretty good. So another thing to think about. We went to Western Canada. Somebody said they were in Vancouver. But we were going on something I had heard about the Icefields Parkway. Another thing you should do before you die it is in Alberta. It's between Banff and Jasper. It is one of the most spectacular drives and roads. You've been someone shaking their head here, right? It's amazing. And it's scenic drives in Canada. It's called the Icefields Parkway. And all I can tell you is you want to stop every three minutes and make pictures. It is just wonderful. Try to go and do it. You need a car. Don't do it on a tour bus. <laughs> Please don't do it on a tour bus. <laughs> and it's just a wonderful, wonderful trip. Again, I learned all about it by doing some research before I went. Maybe you like to go to the national parks out west. Bryce Canyon is a wonderful place. I highly recommend it. Before I went, I got the map of Bryce Canyon. And on the map, there's a place called Sunrise Point. Now, that sounds like something I might be interested in. And so I checked out before what time sunrise was. And then I got there about 45 minutes or an hour before, because it's a very small spot, not a room for a lot of people. And I was the guy in front. And all the people who came behind me were mumbling nasty words under their breath, because I was there first. And I was able to get the best pictures. Right. So if you go to Bryce, beautiful place to photograph. You can't make good pictures quickly, and this is why I am not a fan of things like bus tours, because you get off the bus, you have two minutes to get back on the bus. <laughs> you can't do that. Patience is the way any photographer will tell you they get good pictures. So you're in a spot here in Siena, and it has, it's pregnant with possibilities. A wonderful little street, beautiful light, old stone, but it needs something. And you wait, and there are tourists in the way, and a car goes by. And then if you're lucky, the little kids come by. And that makes the picture. Look at the lady in the window, too. You see her? Mexico. 
wow, it's like a little stage set, right? But it needs something. There's nothing going on. And then this dog comes by. Oh, and that's pretty good. But then the kid is behind the dog. And then there's a man on a cell phone behind the kid. And so now you got a picture. But I stood there across the street for maybe 15 or 20 minutes because I saw something. I thought, wow, what a scene. You know, what a background. And then and now sometimes nothing happens. And those are the pictures I am not showing you. <laughs> but when something does happen, then you get a good one once in a while. I love the chickens. The, everything. It all worked. When I saw that, I said I had to I have to photograph that. And I lucked out with enough patience. If you're fortunate, something good will come of it. Same thing here. It's a bridge in Venice. It's okay, but it's a lot. And you're hanging around. Oh, here comes a speedboat. Look, here comes two speedboats, right? And you keep, don't stop. Keep, everyone shoots and looks at the back of the camera. Stop looking at the back of the camera. Look in the viewfinder and watch the world going by. The back of the camera is unimportant. The picture comes out. Don't look at it. And I just keep photographing. And I don't know if it's good enough, so I come back at night also. So you're in Florence, and you're headed for dinner, and you go across, and you say, oh, wow, the lights are just coming on in the Ponte Vecchio. And you figure, if you stay there longer, it'll get better. But your family is saying, come on, come on, let's go, enough pictures, let's go to dinner. So you go with them to dinner, and you miss this picture. Right? This is 15 minutes later the same spot. So it's patience. This is potential. Oh, they're starting to turn the lights on. And then you don't want to go too long, because then the sky gets black and the water gets black. So there's just a 10-minute window when it's just right. So you're out in Tuscany in a beautiful landscape, but the sun is behind the clouds. And then all of a sudden, oh, look what's happening. There's a little bit of light. That's cool. But you don't just take it and walk away, because maybe the clouds will move a little more, and, and you'll get that. See the difference? But it takes a little time to wait. It doesn't always move right. It comes out, goes behind, it sneaks up on you. You've got to be ready. India. Nice scene. Woman is harvesting. I don't know exactly what. And I could have taken this picture, it would have been okay, and walked away. But I hung around, and then she walked down the field, and I think that's a nicer picture. I didn't just take one and run away. When I see something that I think has possibilities, I don't go from place to place to place. I just stay there and, as photographers say, I work the scene. I see what else might happen. I change my point of view. I change lenses. I wait for the light to change. And if I'm attracted to it, it means there's a reason that it has potential there. And then that attraction, though, is not the picture. It usually needs more than just the initial attraction. So I think that's a little stronger. You've made a lot of pictures. They're wonderful. You want to make sure they come home with you. So one of the things that a lot of people do is they just bring lots of memory cards, and they don't have to download anything. Memory cards are cheap, and they just bring the memory cards home. Memory cards are very stable. Don't put them in your shirt pocket with pizza crumbs. You know, Put them in some secure place. Don't put them in your luggage, bring them on the plane. Um, I like to put them in these crush-proof, waterproof little cases. Um, if you happen to be bringing a tablet, you can download your pictures to a tablet. Um, really only if you're shooting JPEG. If you're shooting RAW, some software won't even accept RAW, and also it's going to fill up what little memory you have in your tablet right away. Um, some cameras now have built-in Wi-Fi that you can transfer, or Bluetooth that you can transfer from the camera to your computer or device. You can also get these iFi cards that will fit in any camera. It sets up a little hotspot, and you can also transfer from there to your tablet if you want. Um, when I travel, since I also teach and I'm a little more serious, I do bring my laptop, but I also bring two hard drives. Everything gets backed up twice. In my life, there's no such thing as one no backup. Everything gets backed up twice. If you don't want to bring your entire laptop, um, Western Digital and some other companies now make a device. It's basically a hard drive with an SD card slot. You put the card in, and it sucks the images. You can't see anything. It's just a hard drive. But it lets you clear off your 
memory card and put it on the hard drive. The trouble with these things is they're spinning devices and they're a little frail, and there's only one of them. So you don't get backup. What some people do is they'll leave it on the card and in the hard drive, and they just use a fresh card. So you have your backup that way. Just depends how important your pictures are to you. People ask me about cloud storage. And certainly, I just read yesterday that Google is now offering two terabytes of cloud storage for 10 bucks a month. Cloud storage when you're traveling is at best only appropriate if you're shooting JPEG. You cannot upload raw files. And I find that even though wherever I go it says we have free Wi-Fi, it's usually pretty flaky and pretty slow. And so for me, cloud storage is just not feasible. If you're staying at a nice hotel for a few days, maybe you can upload your pictures to the cloud if they're JPEGs. But if you're shooting a lot, uh, you're not in the fanciest hotel with the best Wi-Fi, and you're shooting raw, then cloud storage is not an option for most people. Let's talk about making nice looking pictures a little bit here about composition. Some things to think about. People point their cameras, the center of the image as though it's a rifle. They aim their camera, and whatever they see in the middle, that's the subject, that's what they're photographing. That is not composition, that's marksmanship. Think about the viewfinder as a picture hanging on the wall. Look at the whole frame, run your eye around the perimeter of the frame. The middle takes care of itself. So that's what I believe. I'm always looking around the perimeter. I know what the subject is, but I want to see that it's a photograph. What's the foreground? What's the background? What's the perimeter? What should be there? What should not be in there? Most people have too much crap in their pictures. More things. Now you may chuckle about this, but it's really true. Why? Because when you take a picture of your kid, no matter how terrible the picture is as a photograph, you love your kid. So when you people say, Lester, look at this great picture I took of my kid, right? It's a terrible photograph, but they love their kid, so they think it's a good picture. Who makes the best zoom lenses? Anyone know? <laughs> Another thing to concern yourself with. There are people who have never had the pleasure of taking a vertical picture. On the other hand, people who use iPhones a lot, all their pictures are vertical. They hold it, you know, they hold it out like this. And all, every picture is vertical. They didn't realize that they could turn it this way and take a picture. It's really funny. I see that all the time. And here's a very famous quote. I don't know if any of you have heard this quote. It's very, every photographer in the world knows this quote. And it, it's not that you have to get physically close. What Robert Kappa meant was you have to be there and experience what's going on. You have to feel the situation. If you're a voyeur from across the street, it's not the same. You want to be there. And some of the best photographs were not made with telephoto lenses, but in fact were made with slightly wide angle lenses by street photographers who were there, who were in the action. And so think about that. Don't be afraid and stand back with a telephoto lens, but come in close and get a feel, meet the people, and that's when you're going to get the good pictures, not as a voyeur across the street. So there's Andrea. Andrea has a very nice rear end. It doesn't belong in the middle of the frame like that. There's all this junk around here that doesn't belong there. That's the right way to make the same picture. Now you see the lavender farm. You don't have all this foreground nonsense. And you can still photograph your loved one, but now you can see where you were and what was going on. Same thing here. We were on a canoe trip. There she is in the middle of the picture. That's the wrong place to put her. You can still show your loved one with the dog and the scenery at the same time.
So think about making a photograph, not grabbing a snapshot of your loved one in the middle of the frame over and over like that. Right? It's a wonderful picture of your friends and the whole kitchen. You know, you don't need the pantry and the sink and everything else. At least go in closer if you're going to photograph your relatives. Typical tourist picture. There they are again, right in the middle of the picture, right? Well, you can show them, but in the context of the Palatine Hill in Rome, you know? So then you get two for one. You get the scenery and the story, and you get your loved ones if you insist on putting them in every picture, which you probably shouldn't do anyway. So here we are on a boat between the North and South Islands of New Zealand. And so there's my loved one in the middle of the picture. So that's no good. So you're getting closer, but now it doesn't show any context. You come back here, that's a little better, but I'm still working on it, and finally I get this picture. Now there's your loved one, there's the boat, and there's the scenery. And so it makes a statement instead of just another snapshot of your loved one's head. Same thing here, there's the beach, and you see the people in the beach, and you're not looking at all the extraneous stuff around, so either move your butt or zoom the lens and get a better picture. How big is the waterfall? I don't know. It's, the picture doesn't help me. So you say, all right, I'm going to put my loved one in the picture. Well, now I still don't know how big the waterfall is. So you go to the trouble of climbing over the boulders, and now you put your loved one in the picture, and now you got a photograph. You say, oh, that's really a big waterfall. But you got to think about how can I make a picture, not just grab a snapshot. I'm always thinking about how to make a picture interesting. You see the pretty flowers along the road. But the road is doing nothing to help the pictures. So you get a little closer, and there's still road. And that's not part of the photograph. Who cares about the stupid road? What you want to do is photograph what attracted you in the first place, which is the pretty flower. Um, I'm also a believer, and I like to photograph the actual journey, the going and getting there, right? So whenever possible, I try to arrange to fly at sunrise or sunset and get a window seat, because I love to photograph out the window. I'm not interested in watching television. I love to photograph out the window. Right before we land. All right, so some rules. Right? By the way, never use the word shooting when on an airplane. Right? Don't do that. Right. So obviously, that's the most important thing. And you can go to Seat Guru, and it tells you the configuration of the airplane you're on. And so you want to get a seat that's either way behind the wing or way in front of it. You don't want to be over the wing, because then it's in your way. So if you get your seat soon enough, and now you have to pay $15 sometimes to get the seat you want, but to me it's worth it if I can get a window seat. All right, clean the window. I always bring a little cloth with me, fingerprints. Don't lean your camera against the window because it vibrates from the engines, right? Um, use a large aperture so that puts the out of focus scratches, or well, it gets the scratches out of focus. And do not use a polarizing filter because it interacts with the plastic and you get crazy rainbow patterns. And then you can have fun photographing out the window. Sometimes it's really hazy. Even when you're about to land, if you're good with Photoshop or Lightroom, believe it or not, you can make that look like that. It takes a little work, but it's really the same frame. And sometimes, just as you break through the clouds, that's a really good spot. And even at night, when the windows are closed, I'm still photographing. Man, if I'm awake, I'm photographing. And so we were coming back. Uh, my nephew was driving in Texas. You can drive at 75 miles an hour. Uh, I had the window open, and I'm still photographing out the window at a 2,000th of a second shutter speed. Right? And every now and then, I get something. You know, the good thing today with digital photography, film is cheap. So I'm just shooting. I just keep photographing. And every now and then I get something nice. And then we got this great sunset that lasted forever. And in two thousandth of a second, I'm just shooting out the window. <laughs> Another thing you might want to try is video. You all have cameras that have a video setting, a new experience. 
right? So you set it to the video mode. Um, you can use a regular tripod right now. Handheld video, you're gonna give somebody nauseous. Um, if you're serious, you might wanna get a little um, video head that will fit on most tripods. And so here's a modest example of one of the first things I did. Let's see if we can get this going. Whoops, no, where did it go here? Somewhere, there it goes. So this is just camera on the tripod and just slowly zooming the lens. Don't be moving around because people who get started with this, it just gets people vertigo from watching their video. You want the, the, the rule is when you get started, have the camera steady and let the action happen in front of you. That's a good, good rule of thumb. This idea that if you're a great photographer, you go click, it comes out of the camera perfectly and you can hang it on the wall is almost never the case. Everything needs some tweaking. And it's not immoral and it's not against the law. So, things that you might want to do is all, any software that came with your camera is a way to get started. You don't need Lightroom, you don't have to start with Photoshop, which is ferocious. So some basic things that you might want to do to improve your photography. I'm a big believer in cropping in the camera. People say, oh, I'll crop later, that's sloppy photographing, but sometimes, I call it trimming as opposed to cropping. <laughs> There's a big difference. So this is okay, and that's much stronger. If this is as close as you can get, so maybe you can do a little judicious cropping. Sometimes the exposure can use a little brightening or darkening. And so the one on the right, I think, is a lot better, and it's just a little tweak you can do in any software by increasing the exposure. Sometimes the white balance, like this is in the shade, it's okay, but to me it's a little cool. You can warm up the picture by warming up the white balance. Here's another picture. It's okay, but that's more okay. So these are just small tweaks that take literally 10 seconds on any picture, and it just brings it back to life. Here's a picture in the fog. It's okay, that's more okay. See the difference? Just small little tweaks that helps the picture. Same thing here. This is the basic out of camera exposure, and I just made it a little darker, a little richer. Here versus here. Thank you again for wearing a red jacket. So these are very important. You know, the light can be harsh. The camera does not see like your eye. They are different. So you can make it closer to what you saw and enhance the photograph tremendously. This was taken in, the, in an alley which was very, very blue. And believe it or not, that's from the same frame. Harsh light, you can soften it from here to here. This is the way it was out of the camera, but the way I saw it was more like that because your eye has a much greater brightness range than the camera. There's nothing immoral about doing that. On top of a mountain, there's a lot of haze. Add a little contrast, saturation, and bring it back to life. So almost all my pictures get tweaked to one degree or another. Some get tweaked a lot, and some just need a little bit like this. Just a small difference from here to here. All right. From here, mercury vapor light's very green, color correct, and you push the button, make it black and white. Each one of those steps is 20 seconds. Antarctica, let's make some black and white. Very easy to do. Back in Tuscany, that's very pretty, but I even like it as a black and white. It doesn't hurt anything. You, if you do it right, you can't hurt the pictures. You can make theme and variation. Enjoy yourself. Take your pictures and polish them, so to speak, and get something better out of the basic photograph. How many of you here shoot RAW versus JPEG? How many shoot RAW? Just a few of you. <coughs> there is nothing wrong with JPEG. Don't have anyone intimidate you. The advantage of raw files is you can pull more out of the shadows. You can recover washed out highlights. And so while you can tweak a JPEG a lot, you can tweak a raw file even more. But raw files are about 10 times larger. 
you can't upload to Facebook or an email. You've got to do something with a raw file. And a lot of people, understandably, don't want to be bothered. But as you get to be more serious, you might want to start shooting some raw files if you're willing to tweak. If you're not going to tweak your pictures, you're wasting your time. The nice thing about a digital camera, you can shoot a whole bunch of JPEG, go to the menu and switch, and you can shoot some raw, and then go back to shooting JPEGs if you want. So I'm not going to get into the pros and cons, but if you're going to be serious about your work and eventually want to tweak them a lot, that's where the advantage of a raw file is, because they have much greater information. So when you have a picture like this, you can, it's amazing what you can pull out of, the, out of the frame. And this was taken with my first Fuji camera. And look at, look at what you can pull out of that. It's remarkable. This is out of the camera, and this is enhanced. So the information is there, but you've got to be willing to move the sliders around and spend time in front of your computer. And some people don't want to do that. Right. Pretty remarkable. The information is there, but you've got to bring it back to life. And on some of these, if they were JPEG, it would definitely be better. Not quite as good. This you could never get. This is a raw file. Look at this. Right. Believe it or not, it's the same because it's extreme. I'm shooting into the sky. It's very dark in the vineyard, and yet the information is buried there in the raw file. You could get some of this out of a JPEG, but not as much. Same thing here. Now, this you could get out of a JPEG because it's not too extreme. Again, opening up the shadows. This is the way the camera saw it. This is what's there. And then when you get really sophisticated and have the time and learn Photoshop, I tell people if you can imagine it, you can do it in Photoshop. You can go from here, straighten out the building. Amalfi, shooting into the sun, put in a new sky, straighten out the building. I mean, this is probably two hours worth of work. But this is not saleable, and that is. Fish market in Venice. That guy in the background who let him in, you know, he shouldn't be there. Make him go away. Make him darker, blurry, and crop from here to here. Antarctica, drizzly gray day, bring it back to life. These buildings face north. They'll never be in the sun. Well, I can play God and make it sunshine. And then even fix the clouds. Um, Argentina. Cloudy, drizzly day, bring those dramatic clouds back to life, add some contrast to the mountains, foreground, and we go from this to that. But that's Photoshop. Same here, from here to here. It's the same scene. Suppress the sky, open up the shadows in the foreground. The Dolomites, same thing. Recognize this lady? Look at that. That's, those are the cranes in New Jersey. <laughs> now, if you looked through the camera, would you bother taking that picture? But knowing what I can do when I get back home, it allows me to do photography that I never would have done in the film days. Nice scene. Too many damn tourists. Make the damn tourists go away. Same here. Tourists all over the place. Let's get rid of the tourist, get rid of the sign. So this is sophisticated Photoshop. You go somewhere, you photograph the animals, but there aren't enough animals, right? So we can make more animals. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing you might consider is panoramas, right? This is a typical wide angle. Your kit lens will go about this wide. And yet I can make a picture this wide by putting together all these individual frames. So I'm holding the camera vertically and going click, 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 click. And then there's lots of software that will automatically stitch it together so you can get this picture from this. This is a, a wide angle scene on top of a mountain. This is the same scene with a panorama where I put a series of pictures together. There's Florence, all made from all these pictures. This is literally 180 degrees from left to right. You cannot get this with one lens. There's no lens that will get that in because it's a full 180 degrees from one side to the other. So it's, I love it for scenery, 
It's very easy to do. All panoramas stitched together automatically. The trick is you've got to keep the camera level. You want to shoot in manual mode when you do this. Because if you're in any automatic mode, the light and everything will change in the focus. So you, you turn off autofocus, you turn off any automatic shutter priority, aperture priority, automatic, everything is off. So everything is exactly the same as you take one picture to the last, and then the stitching software will be happy. But if the exposures change or the focus changes as you move from left to right, then it won't stitch it properly. So it's all done manually. All right, so here's a scene um, near the Austrian border. And um, you can see, if you zoom in on this, you can see how sharp it is. So that's just a little piece of this frame, believe it or not. Because when you put so many pictures together, you have a huge pixel count compared to just one single frame. And then what you can do also, there's software out there, again, pretty simple software, that you can create a video from that panorama. So it looks like I've actually panned the camera, but it's actually a still picture. And the software is panning across my still and creating for all the world what looks like a video. So it's pretty cool. Come back, you've got all this great stuff. You want to share your trip and harass your relatives, right? And so you probably know that there are lots of photo sharing sites where you can upload your pictures, your JPEGs, and then you send a link to your friends and relatives and they can look at your pictures. And that's a cool thing to do. Or you can put them on your tablet and you can carry them around so next Thanksgiving you can bore everyone with all the pictures of yourself standing in front of a church somewhere. And so a tablet's fun. Another thing you can do today, has anyone made a book? No one's made a book. There's wonderful companies out there um, like Blurb and Shutterfly. You can make your own book and it is so cool, right? Here's a real book I made. This was when we were in Europe a few years ago and it's a real book. It feels and tastes and smells like a real book and it's so much fun and relatively inexpensive. You can do big ones and small ones and paperback and hardcover and black and white and color and you can put text in the pictures and go on and on and on. And it's a great way, a suggestion when you start, just just do an inexpensive small one and get the hang of it and how it works. And uh, one of my students, Barbara Wagner, did a calendar when we went to Venice. And so they make great gifts. Um, people do books of poetry and in uh, family history. Another thing you can do, you probably don't know, most of your cameras now have an HDMI output. You can plug your camera into the television set and again, bore your relatives for four hours in front of their 52-inch TV. Or if you're in a hotel room, right, you can look at your pictures. You scroll through the pictures on the back of the camera, and they come out on the TV. So buy yourself a cable for four bucks, plug your camera into the TV, and now you can see it that big. So definitely another thing that you can try. Or you can make a simple slideshow. Again, there's lots of software for consumers that make a simple slideshow. So let's see if we can get this running. Um, our trip to Spain. So what happened here? Is this running? Let's see. There it goes. Let's see. Yeah, it's running. So this is without sound. So you start at the airport, the airplane that you get on, and then this software just automatically lines up your pictures and makes a nice transition from one to the other. And you can actually save this as a, um, a PDF or an MP3, and you can email your slideshow to somebody all put together, and in some cases, you can even uh, put text on it. So that's uh, definitely a possibility. And in some cases also, you can tell the slideshow to zoom in. It looks very, very professional and very nice, and you can send it to your friends and relatives or, or post it on YouTube, something like that. Okay? 
So those are just some things that um, I hope you found a little stimulating, something to think about. I do want to mention once more uh, my travel workshops where you can actually put all this stuff into practice and have yours truly there to assist you. We visit places like Florence uh, and Siena. We go to a vineyard. Uh, we have dinner one night at a winery. Um, you saw this picture in Siena. And this is the view from the patio at the monastery every morning. The sun comes up through the fog. And this is where we have our meals, and this is what a typical room looks like. That's one of our students in the morning in the olive groves. For those of you at home watching, again, you can go to my website, and on the top of my website is the links to both Tuscany and to Venice. And Hopefully we'll see you there. If you're in the city or near the city, um, I do teach workshops at the International Center of Photography in New York City. If you want, you can email me questions. If you have a link to my website, there's a link to me. You can even call me, I'm available. Um, and I hope to see some of you workshops in Italy or whatnot. So I thank you very much for listening at home or for coming. Thank you. Thank you.